All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining uh, our webinar today, 2021 Trends and Finance Analytics. Uh, just before we get started, wanted to go over a few housekeeping items with everyone. Um, there will be time for Q&A during the webinar and after. So if you have questions, please feel free to leave any of them uh, in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and we'll be um, looking for those throughout the webinar. Uh, we are recording today's session and I'll be sending out a follow-up email with uh, the recording as well as the slide deck. So if you have any questions or issues, um, feel free to reach out to Xperio Internal. I will be happy to help you um, with any issues you might be having. Uh, other than that, we'll go ahead and get started. We do have a full um, agenda today. So I'll start off and uh, kick it over to Sebastian Good from Xperio. Hey, thanks very much. And thanks everyone for joining us, whether it's live or in Memorex. Uh, today, we're gonna have a little conversation with the four of us on the phone here. I'm Sebastian, I'm the CEO of Xperio. Um, my background is technical and I love nothing more than making finance apps go fast. Uh, but the real stars of the show are Lynn, my co-founder, who is the champion of all things UX design and product design and leads our financial services practice here at Xperio, Tim Baker, uh, head of IEX Cloud and Edward Metz, who has been more places than you can count. And uh, each of them will have a chance to introduce themselves uh, in a minute. But the, the obligatory, hi, who the heck are we? Let me just share a little bit about who Xperio is. We're a, uh, a product development and consulting firm that builds software and data science and data analytics products for expert users. So we have helped a lot of companies go build their own new solutions, modernize their old solutions, find insights in their data, and in some cases even uh, have toolkits to help them with that. In finance in particular, which is a really big part of our business, we've helped people build new products from scratch. We've helped people modernize their existing products. We've gone in and built uh, machine learning and data science capabilities. And we have some specialized things we're particularly known for, uh, specifically graph and connected data. Um, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about our resume in the industry, you know, we have a website where we talk about things like a neat trading platform, the Open Door Treasury trading platform uh, that we built. I worked with a number of clients on uh, front office and portfolio management, treasury management uh, type of applications. We've helped some banks with their analytics infrastructure, security, data lakes, that sort of thing. Uh, and especially in the area of fraud and financial crimes, we've done a lot of work with, with graph analytics. And, and just worth mentioning, if you guys find that interesting, there's a few places around fraud financial crimes and building finance apps like we're going to talk about today, where we've even got some toolkits uh, that are coming out. And, and in particular, I'm very excited Tim is on the call because he is one of our partners for getting a finance toolkit out to the masses with real high quality data, free and otherwise from IEX and high quality visualizations and analytics from us uh, coming out hopefully soon uh, with the OpenFin launch. What do you think, Tim? Super exciting, right? Very exciting. Yeah, it's nice to be working <laughs> with you guys. Um, and so uh, with, with that uh, graceful entree, Tim, tell us a little bit about you and IEX Cloud and what you're doing while you're here. Sure. Um, for, the, for those of you who don't know um, IEX or the IEX name, IEX Group is the holding company for uh, IEX Exchange, uh, which was actually featured in a book uh, that many of us will have read um, called Flash Boys, written by Michael Lewis. And it's all about uh, the challenges and, and disruption going on in, in the uh, US exchange business. Um, IEX Cloud is the nascent data business of IEX Group. I was founded a couple of years ago and uh, I joined the firm in February to, to run the business. And uh, it's basically a technology platform that seamlessly connects data providers on the left of the graphic uh, with data consumers um, through a high performance API. And it's that API that your team are using Sebastian to build, to build the, uh, the gateway app for us. Um, yep. It's very popular amongst sophisticated end users uh, they could be individual investors or developers, and increasingly which we're, we're going after the enterprise use cases, um, hence our partnership with firms like OpenFin. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of our core data is really what you'd expect to find in much more expensive desktop products, um, and we also provide live streaming prices. So, you know, we provide live data free of charge uh, out to institutions and, and through our API. Um, 
And um, you know, the starting price of our product is $9 a month. So you can imagine that's pretty unusual in a market which is dominated by you know, multi-thousand, multi-million dollar month uh, kind of bills. Um, so really excited to be here and, and uh, looking forward to getting into the topics. Cool, thanks. Um, uh, Edward, tell yes. us a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the introduction, Sebastian. Uh, my name is Edward Metz. I've spent the better part of the last two decades uh, doing business line and product management in and around the financial services space. Uh, most recently, I was with uh, Virtus Partners, which is a firm that specializes in alternative asset um, administration. So we do a lot of middle and back office work for folks in the uh, alternative asset space, spe specifically around leveraged loans, structured products, a lot of your less liquid assets where you have a lot of evolving um, technology, a lot of evolving systems. And for the, the better part of the last year, help them help shepherd them through their acquisition by FIS, which is a, you know, a giant in the, in the fintech space. Fantastic. So the format here is going to throw a topic out for conversation and uh, hear from you guys about your thoughts about what happened in 2020 and 2021. So why don't we start with the elephant in the room, COVID. Uh, let's see, here at Expiro, we had clients go dark on us for months, just getting everyone productive at home, like mailing them laptops and figuring out what their passwords were and all the things. Like in principle, we can all work remotely, but in practice, it was hard you know, for some of the customers we had. Uh, we had clients who needed to focus on that or, or focus on keeping critical markets running, right? Like market critical uh, functions more than they needed to think about innovating. So actually it was uh, COVID made some of the, the, the finance sector kind of quiet for us. Uh, but, you know, it, it sent everyone home, right? Here's one of our employees home uh, workstations next to his washing machine, right? Everyone went from traders with eight screens, someone else set up to them to like a laptop on their kitchen counter. They're fighting their three-year-old for. So, you know, we certainly saw a big impact. Um, Edward, I'd love to hear a little bit about what you saw with, uh, with COVID this year. Yeah, so with, with our clients, it was very much kind of a crisis management mode. As you were mentioning, um, the market slowed down. A lot of the structured markets slowed down. Um, but, you know, a lot of the, your financial professionals were very concerned about the, the performance of their assets. So maybe they weren't coming out with a lot of new deals, but obviously had to stay on top of all of the assets in the deals that they were currently managing. Um, so we really had a lot of uh, demands put on our systems to give people um, different reporting than they might have had traditionally or mm. uh, speeding up the cycle. So a lot of things that were maybe on weekly, monthly, quarterly cycles, people needed to be able to you know, get at least some information on a daily basis. And so that put, uh, I wouldn't say stress on our systems, but it really challenged uh, us and our systems uh, to be able to meet the, the, the demands of our, of our clients. Then toward the latter half of the year, uh, the markets did start to warm back up again and things kind of got back to normal. But as you mentioned, everybody was still working remotely. So there was a big stress test on, could you take the entire financial services industry, take them out of their offices, you know, where all the supposed innovation, the deal making, all of that happens. And can you do that uh, from a home setting? And I think that the, the industry really came through with, with flying colors in, in that regard. So we're hearing, you know, clients have been saying that even when they go back to the offices and, you know, I don't know anybody that's even thinking about going back before mid-year next year, um, it would probably be more in a hybrid role. Um, mm -hmm. People are at least going to work from home at least uh, a certain period of the time. Uh, Virtus, our firm in particular, because we are uh, an outsourcing agent, people actually outsource administrative functions to us. Um, for years, we had gone through a lot of disaster recovery drills and, and would basically right. uh, you know, do something a week or two at a time, send people home. And so we just kind of were able to just build right on that. And, 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 uh, and we didn't really miss, miss anything um, with regards to client deliverables. You're right about that. I mean, we met you the old fashioned way on the top of a skyscraper, but I met Tim on a webinar, right? This is old plus new right here. Uh, yep. This is, uh, it, it can be done, gentlemen. Uh, let's see, uh, Lynn, how about you? And I know you had a, uh, a visual aid here. Tell us, Lynn, how did COVID yeah. affect us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, from, from our perspective, uh, some of the things that we heard a lot from our clients, um, to echo 
from what Edward was saying is, you know, just once they got got the 6,000 laptops rolled out and the monitors and everything at home, you know, there was still this like reality setting in of, okay, now how am I going to do this? How am I going to actually manage? I used to work with eight displays. I got to get it down to two. Um, people were reaching out and saying, you know, how can I, how can I build something, maybe build it quickly. It's a more customizable environment for my users so that they don't have to have, um, you know, eight stacked with monitor kind of a thing. There were there were some uh, some rather clever um, things that uh, people were coming up with. Uh, for one thing, um, enabling their users to kind of extend their desktop experience and it, with mobile um, devices. So we we had a number of clients who were embracing utilizing tablets maybe to run some quick calculations or Excel or other types of notebooks, you know, um, is yet another display mechanism for managing certain kinds of workflows as well as getting to mobile faster. So uh, clients who thought mobile was years off or maybe there was no solid use case for it. All of a sudden that percolated up to the top of um, being able to keep the workflows moving even when you're, you're quarantined you know, at home um, while you're, you're dealing with the kids or, or whatever it is, you can get onto your mobile and, and kind of continue making those, those workflows go. Um, and so a lot of people were extending in, in kind of those ways. Um, one of the things that we heard um, which um, was interesting is sort of this like you, you think of people involved in in uh, finance as always being kind of tuned in, especially in front office. You know, having to make those decisions, you're tuned into the news. Um, but a lot of those events that uh, folks are typically tuned into um, are things they've kind of seen before, and that maybe they already know how to deal with, um, or they can run another model for that, or stress test their portfolio. Um, but uh, there was this term that kept coming up as kind of this hyper vigilance that was happening around um, COVID because it was new and novel and no one had seen kind of a shock to the market that they could model um, like this. And so it was mm. kind of sucking some of the energy out as well as dealing with this like, you know, really chaotic desktop situation. Um, and it was interesting that we got that feedback um, with a number of our clients and their users that, that we were talking to at this hypervigilance um, and lack of tools for that, that they had to keep yeah. up with. Yeah, it's funny, uh, you, you mentioned mobile. I remember when we used to say, hey, a modern UX is often multimodal. Like, what do you wanna do on your phone? The reaction would be like, ah, Jeff can't trade at lunch. That's not right. <laughs> and now it's like, Jeff's at home with his phone and he's got to trade, right? So the, the yeah. whole conversation accelerated totally uh, changed. Uh, yep. very quickly, right? Yeah. Um, Tim, how about your thoughts? So I joined IX in February last year. So just before, you know, COVID really got going and, um, Luckily, the exchange and the DNA that my business inherited from the exchange meant we were we had a lot of new kit. Um, the IX cloud was built on the cloud, so we're, we're you know, on GCP. And so even though I was only in the office for five or six weeks, I got to know the team. And then we all overnight went remote. There was no one left behind. Um, we bought a bunch of screens. I, was, I realized quickly they would start running out. So we just went out and let everyone order screens. Uh, and it, it went really smoothly. Now, at the same time, I was laying out the growth plan for the business um, and the exchange is growing as well and our other startup businesses are growing. So we've hired, we're about 150 people, I think, as a group. Um, we've hired about 40 odd people um, since COVID started all remotely. Yeah. Uh, my team has doubled in size. We went through a massive migration with, you know, half the team new. And it just shows you the ingenuity of human beings to kind of solve problems. Um, you know, we, we got the job done and, the, you know, we hired some great talent. Um, and, um, you know, we're just kind of moving from strength to strength from that, from that core. Um, talking to clients and the institutional clients, uh, and we know the banks have had a pretty good year. Um, but obviously this was a catalyst for them to really look at how they work. And, you know, I think I've certainly sensed a lot of those projects that were kind of, oh yeah, we need to modernize this or change that workflow. I think they've gathered steam. Uh, a friend of mine's a CTO at a big bank. He's got 500 apps in his portfolio that have been built over the year. And uh, they're big open fin fans. Um, and he said, you know, we're just systematically going through the apps and modernizing them, cleaning them, replacing them, consolidating them. And obviously looking at things like interoperability and how to do this using using the new tech stack. Um, 
So I think it's catalyzed a lot of interest. The one other thing that we noticed, I know you guys had a bit of a slowdown with, you know, as people were kind of doing all that kind of rethinking. Um, we actually doubled our growth rate for about three or four months. Um, yeah. Because we've got a lot of people that maybe were working from home or they had projects that required them to get data quickly. Uh, maybe they didn't have access to that shared Bloomberg. Um, yeah. You know, a kiosk that's sitting on the floor with the sticky keyboards <laughs> didn't really work in COVID, right? Um, so I think there's a lot of healthy rethinking. And I think to Edward's point, um, a lot of this is going to stick. You know, I think a lot of people have realized they need modern workflows. They need yep. to allow remote working. Um, you, know, I, you know, we plan to go back in the office. I look forward to going back in the office. But we're also recruiting at the moment. And we're now saying, Permanently remote, that's fine too. You know, we've realized we can make that eat that work. We'd rather get the talent in the door uh, than have them actually physically have to go through the door. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, we saw that we all saw this across all aspects of our lives, didn't we? That COVID sort of washed away some of the stupid that had yeah. accumulated, right? There was just no time for it, right? I mean, okay, I can't get to that terminal. I'm going to go find some data online. Tim, hey, your data's great. Let, let's go do it. People like just got it done. It wasn't in a way. You know, let's not set aside the human costs that it had, but from a, a commercial perspective, it was actually amazing how much we just kept going, right? Uh, yeah. Actually, really quite wonderful. Uh, so I'm glad you mentioned uh, the desktop. That was another thing I wanted to talk about. That's certainly been a, been a big part of our conversation this year. And, you know, speaking of your friend with the 500 applications, um, you know, especially in our capacity as, uh, you know, product and user experience designers, we work a ton on modernization products, you know, OpenFin, you mentioned, we work a lot with them as well. Um, looking at how that front office and middle office can be a more productive space, you know, I think the, the workhorses of the industry are often aging, right? They still do good work, but from a tech and usability perspective, people look at them and say, oh, we can do better or we don't have, you know, we can't find the talent to, to build uh, on this platform anymore. And, you know, and frankly, workers are bringing consumer expectations to the desktop. Uh, I'm curious, you know, what else are we seeing happening on the desktop in 2021? Why don't we start with, uh, with you, Lynn? Yeah, so we, uh, you know, we've seen people kind of start to move away, some of it due to the remote work situation, but move away from that sort of single page, single window kind of view of the world. Um, and they want to uh, be able to personalize a lot more. They're thinking more, uh, you know, to your point, Tim, 500 applications, they're thinking more like at that component, that atomic level of what pieces of information, what pieces of data do they need? Let's pop up a window with just that data, but IEX data mm -hmm. or whatever data it is, right? Let's pop that up. Um, and they want to be able, they don't want IT to personalize it for them. They want to do it. They want to be able to mix and match on their own. And they want these flexible environments um, you know, where they can mix and match and the data sources can interoperate, right? Um, and so there's been kind of this, like you said, Sebastian watched away the stupid, like, you know, well, why are we stuck here? There's so much more we can do now, right? There are these great technologies like OpenFin and others where you can, you can um, it, that serve as the glue to, to allow this, this level of customization and mixing, matching and, and all the great data sources that are available, like, like IAX. Um, you know, and the, the other thing that, that we've seen, um, is uh, wanting to really kind of start to embrace where the next gen users are. I think while we're in this sort of like upheaval of, of change, um, there has been an acknowledgement of hmm, maybe some of the old ways of doing things while we're changing things, maybe some of the old ways um, have kind of topped out. Maybe they're not even gonna go away. Maybe in the case of Excel, for example, we're still gonna do the things we do in Excel, but there are these other ways of working that by the way, our next gen users are naturally bringing to the table because they've right. used notebooks in graduate school or whatever, right? And they, they, they are not necessarily even data scientists, but you know, they, they're saying, I, I'm comfortable running a little piece of code or I'm comfortable inheriting code someone else has written and looking at it and understanding you know, what, the, what my portfolio looks like or what the root cause of my compliance issue is. Um, and so we're, we're seeing, um, you know, an augmenting of, of next generation tools like notebooks and other things kind of getting injected into um, a lot of the, these existing workflows. Yeah, you've already got an awesome. interface there that, that everybody has on their desktop. Everybody's using um, just getting plugged into smart data sources and easier to use interfaces that, you know, that's, that's what people are going to be expecting. Meet them where they are, yeah. 
Um, yep. uh, let's see. Uh, let me uh, let me hear from you, Tim. Yeah, so um, completely agree with that, Lynn. Um, you know, I think when Mark Andreessen came out, it was 2011, he said software is going to eat the world. Um, <laughs> he was completely right. And I think but what's interesting is I think software is eating the world from the developer end. And we've seen a huge amount of innovation in terms of the tools to write code, you know, containerization, you know, uh, of applications. So that's OpenFin containerization of workloads in the cloud. Um, just tools like um, Jira and GitHub, those didn't exist 15 years ago, right? Um, and so the development cycle is dramatically compressed. The tools are better. Uh, the adopt, you know, everyone's using JavaScript and modern code and open source. All of that stuff is fantastic. And obviously GCP running BigQuery, uh, AI and machine learning. Um, what I thought I would talk about is the other end, which is the, the non-developers, right? So they've started to benefit from the advances in technology. Um, so I put at the bottom of this, there's over, you know, there's about 750 million users of Excel, right? And they use it a lot in financial services. I, you know, I grew up using Lotus 1, 2, 3, that ages me a bit, but huge oh. Excel user all my life. And I was playing around with this thing that is now part of Excel called Power Query, right? It's an ETL layer built into Excel. So I can now hit the IEX Cloud API. I can pull in a big blob of data. I can shrink the number of columns. I can clean up a column. I can change from epoch date to Excel date uh, just a, through a GUI. I'm not writing code. Yeah. And then I hit done and it drops all of that data, compresses it, loads it and drops it into Excel. And now I can, I can do my calculation or whatever. Um, so that, so Excel is kind of responding to um, what's going on and the threat, I think, from all of these kind of, you know, other layers of the stack. So now, then you've got the BI professionals, right? So they're using slightly more technically, you know, complex tools like Tableau, they're creating, they're doing visualizations those tools keep getting more and more powerful. And then the next layer up, you've got these kind of, no, what they call no-code tools, right? So these are the UI paths, um, Stacker, which claims to be able to take kind of the stuff that was built in Excel and turn it into an app or help you build a, you know, a reliable, repeatable uh, piece of software. And then you've got low-code. Now, Python is a programming language, but as Lynn said, it's kind of being used in business. You come out of business school, the chances are now you can code in Python. You know how to create a data pipeline. You mm -hmm. get access to Kafka and some of these tools through Python. You get a library, NumPy. We have a library in IEX Cloud, um, you know, uh, PyX, which was built entirely uh, around our API. So you don't have to write a lot of code to get value out of data now. So you've kind of got this You've got the developer community that are getting better tools to build better software. And then you've got the end users that are using that software, but they might also be writing code themselves without realizing it. So I think, you know, I think software is kind of starting to eat software. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. And we, we often sit at Xperia in the middle, helping hook them together. Right. Um, that, that's made it very interesting for us as well. Uh, Edward, your thoughts on the desktop. Yeah, so we, we, we saw increased demand for people moving away from kind of very, um, a, a very set set of standard reports that you would kind of develop and they wouldn't really, you know, change uh, for long periods of time. So people had, you know, the same report coming out over and over again, and you could really repeat that. But COVID really pushed uh, the need for ad hoc data to people to be able to actually get to the data behind that. Uh, still want to be able to, to replicate that kind of standard report, but also do other things with the data uh, because they were stress testing information and they're looking, they were looking to my firm as a provider of that data. Um, you know, how can I get to it quickly, easily? They didn't want to go through a multi-week process of, uh, you know, designing a report, testing the report, having that report published. They needed uh, direct access to information that was clean, standard, and timely and a lot of the, the tools that we were just talking about, you know, were kind of brought up and those will come more to the forefront for your desktop users. I mentioned kind of replacing just standard, um, 
add-ins in, in Excel to actual APIs that you can go log into and publish. We saw a, a big demand to convert a lot of the uh, user applications into APIs, right? Hey, I love this dashboard that you put together for me, this report, but actually I'd like to get direct access to that API. And, and it's in a way that the end user is gonna use it rather than the API being taken over by the IT department at, at one of our clients. You're getting more of that direct connection with that end user. And I don't wanna see the IT you know, departments getting cut out of it, but uh, the role is changing, right? They're more just stewards of making sure that everything is up running that the connectivity stays there, um, that you've got the right types of interconnections, but now you've got a direct um, connection between product people like myself and then and then the end users. You're not, you know, you're not existing behind the edifice of the product at all times. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I guess in the in the 70s and 80s, it was like learn to type. Guess what? <laughs> you know, you have a desktop now, not a secretary. And what what is it now? Learn to program. You don't have an IT department. You got yourself. Like, get after it, son. Right? That's kind of exciting. Yeah, Especially so the when we got rid of all the secretaries, we discovered we didn't know where anything was. But that's a separate <laughs> conversation. <laughs> We're probably going to get into this, but then you know the challenge then becomes making sure that 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 information stack that you're plugging into you know can meet the needs of now a faster way to get to the desktop for the user. Right? You can build a great little app using some of these new tools. But if that data is not there when they need it, you know, that's not really uh, meeting their needs ultimately. Yeah. Well, and actually th that, that brings us really quite cleanly to the, the next topic I wanted to talk about, which, which is literally data. I mean, to us, it seems like it's sort of more widely available and easier for users to mess with mm -hmm. than ever before. And in fact, one of the biggest trends we see in helping people build these applications or build these self-service applications is, you know, our customers, financial firms, are exposing their data more consciously in new forms beyond just their bespoke applications, right? Yeah. They're enabling data scientists and notebooks, they're enabling analysts in Excel, they're enabling programmers with APIs. Um, you know, th that's definitely a big trend. I'd also say as technologists, you know, we see huge innovation in the database space. You know, that there's been an explosion of database technologies in the last 10 years and everyone that was anyone had to try each of them, right? Cassandra and all the things, right? And to some extent, we still see that explosion happening, but we also see some consolidation around, um, you know, the, the old school, the postgresses of the world. Yeah. In this space, finance, you know, time series and graph, I think are interesting and the capacity of in-memory analytics. You know, Tim, you talked about some of the analytics you guys do there. Like a lot of these technology platforms we learned about because they enabled you to deal with really big data while well, the computers got really big too. And so a lot of it's not as big as it used to be. And, and a lot of that, but you know, more data, users uh, addressing data differently and ever more sophisticated tools to deal with data are, are really changing. Tim, I wonder if you might wanna talk about what it looks like from your side, what with you being a data company. Yeah, so I think um, like a lot of industries, you know, the data business, uh, especially in financial services, is going through a lot of change. You know, and, this, and what I think about the supply chain of data, um, which used to be really consolidated across, you know, a small number of very big firms who had acquired smaller firms and built, you know, large teams of people, um, you know, very often offshore in India or Manila. Um, and, you know, it was an expensive thing to get into the data business. You needed a lot of people. You needed mainframe computers. You needed, you know, uh, mm -hmm. server farms. Um, fax machines. Fax machines. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, so I think that the supply chain is, is, is being disrupted, is about to be disrupted. I think you're right. There's a, there's a huge explosion in the amount of data. And you see the you know, the statistics on every day, there's more data generated than, you know, in a day than there was, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a growing ecosystem of firms like Eagle Alpha and Battlefin who are helping to curate that. Um, there, are, there are, you know, obviously um, cloud marketplaces are helping to, you know, kind of land where that data is stored. Um, there's new, and I think a lot of that explosion in data is because there are new ways of gathering the data. Um, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about, you know, kind of um, some of the cloud capabilities like NLP, uh, machine learning, and that's allowing, you know, the replacement, a lot of those manual processes, 
processing, you know, filings and and financial data and hand typing the data, a lot of that is being automated away as it as it as it should be. Um, what that's meaning is that there's new firms coming into the market who have expertise in say financial data that are applying machine learning to be able to collect the data and then making sure their expertise is applied you know, through the code and through that machine learning. Machine learning, we're working with a number of firms that didn't exist five years ago, um, but have now, I, I believe, are represent best in class in, some, in terms of some of those content sets. Um, I mean, look at NLP 10 years ago, very few firms were processing content and extracting metadata from it. And I think yeah. in 2018, Google open sourced BERT, which is kind of the, you know, it's the most incredible NLP algorithm and everyone's using it now. And, you know, a student in college can use BERT. They can get some mm -hmm. hosting and they can build an NLP platform that extracts meaning from, from unstructured data. And then the next layer is the kind of explosion in, in I think what people call the API economy. So the API economy is connecting this data through an ecosystem instead of it all being centralized in one place, gathered in one place, and then distributed from the one, that one place, the model is going federated. And, and we as a firm sit right in the middle of that because we're taking data from those new empowered data vendors. And they might, they might not have an API, but they're dropping that data to us. We atomize the data and then put it into Google and make it and put it into MemSQL. Um, which is now called single store, which is a high performance SQL database. And we can we deliver that data out to customers really fast. And that means that we've kind of massively simplified the development process for the customers who are taking that data through a single API and building their AI machine learning uh, analytics, yep. whatever. So, so the supply chain is fundamentally changing or will fun, you know, I believe over the next few years will fundamentally change. And you know, we, we believe in this federated data model. We don't want to be in the content creation business. We're not subject matter experts in filings or in corporate actions or insider traders, but we're very good at collecting data and making it available so that a developer doesn't have to build a data lake to store that. They don't have to plug into 20 sources and write a lot of code because everyone wants to get to that answer really quickly and build that app really quickly. Um, so that's kind of, that's how I think the supply chain is going to change. You know, we, we, we see that ourselves, you know, we go build software for people, but increasingly our engagements also include how do we build APIs for people and how do we get data to people? And just like there's different ways to consume things visually, there's different ways to consume data. Some people need a report. Some people need a live database link. Some people need streaming data. Some people need an API that's in their language of choice, that's idiomatic for them, right? There's, there's just as much sort of experience design and product design around this data world as there is around the more traditional uh, visual artifacts. It's a pretty fascinating uh, place to be. Um, let's see, Edward, what do you think about data these days? Well, uh, in, in addition to data, I think you also have to focus on how these tools can help in the processes that generate the data, right? All of the mm the middle and back office um, functions that, that you have to carry out as part of financial services, or even more specifically, say investment operations, uh, front, middle and back office. You, know, you need to, the front office people want information that's as timely as possible, as flexible as possible. And the middle office folks are basically, you know, taking that kind of post-trade execution, uh, reconciling with similar files with third parties, you know, doing cash management, matching wires to trade records, things like that. And a lot of that is still, even though there are software tools that are helping them, you know, those are some of the older software tools that we were talking about. And, and now they're starting to age out and they're not necessarily, you know, keeping up with some of the changes in, in technology. So you need to be able to have flexible tools that uh, you can sit and work with those subject matter experts and configure those tools so that they can get up and running quickly and then they can adapt as things change. Hey, there's a new regulation that's coming out next month. You know, we don't have six months to go through a whole software development cycle. We need to be able to take you know, the existing desktop and, and whatever's hooked into that and um, sit down with the subject matter experts and tweak that so that we can incorporate those changes 
and move forward without you know disrupting uh, our operations. And so there's a lot in that middle and back office that that you know kind of is, goes on behind the scenes where you're going to be able to apply artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, to create a better process where it's been somewhat automated. Um, sometimes it's been, it's been automated and moved offshore where you're just throwing bodies at it. Uh, I think that's going to come back a little bit where you, you want true automation where you've got you, you know a machine learning process that is doing 99% of it, not just 80% of it. Right. And, and that it's and that it's evolving and improving the output uh, as we go along. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and in fact, we're going to talk about ML in a second. So no points for skipping the line, Edward. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Lynn, tell us what, what we're seeing uh, at Xperia in terms of data this year. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of the things that, you know, have already been mentioned by Tim and Edward, but um, we're also just kind of seeing this general trend that data is becoming increasingly complex, um, particularly in the financial um, sector. And um, some of that, I think it has to do with the, the types of investments um, that are that are being made. So the, there's more investment in illiquid assets and more complex instruments than, than you would have seen previously. Yeah. So you have retirement funds and other, you know, let's say, you know, groups trying to get that return out of the market that they need in order to maintain, um, you know, their target. Targets. Um, and so they're 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 investing in, in other vehicles. Um, and so the complexity of the data is just exploding. Um, along with that, um, people want to be able to make sense of the data in different ways. Um, and so there's this other layer um, kind of that we've seen, which is the connectedness of, of the data. And so being able to tap into relationships in the data, whether that's you know across a portfolio. Um, it could be for compliance. Um, we've seen a lot of this um, pertinent to fraud and financial crimes and being able to spot, you know, um, uh, is a transaction fraudulent or not based on perhaps a, a series of bad actors that are several hops away, but yet that's still really important for being able to identify and make that distinction of is it likely fraudulent, is it likely mon money laundering or not. Um, and so that, that connectedness, I think the priority of being able to connect the data and experience it. And you can see over here, we have a couple of examples of ways you can experience kind of that connectivity of, well, what was the root cause of my compliance failure? Now I could actually see that connected rather than just watching a trend, you know, go up and down or, or who are the bad actors that are a few hops away, you know, you know kind of a thing um, has become very powerful. Yeah, I mean, it's not all grids, Lynn. <laughs> It's, no, imagine it's, that. It's not all tabular. There's relationships here that are interesting and powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so uh, both new ways of looking at data and new ways of refining the data, I mean, brings us to a, an important topic, uh, AI and ML. I believe you're supposed to use one when you're marketing and one when you're programming. I don't remember which is which, but you know, the, the, all these new generation of tools that help uh, uh, our analytics be smarter and stronger and faster, you know, um, uh, at Experio, we've seen this in multiple industries. Uh, we talked a little bit about law enforcement, anti-fraud, you know, using NLP to bypass humans in data pipelines, you know, insurance fraud and looking for drug dealers on the dark web. There's some interesting work we've done there where you'd want to accelerate how fast you can ingest data. NLP, you know, came up for us just like it did for you, Tim. Um, and, and Lynn, as you mentioned, we're seeing customers augmenting ML with connected data, graph data analytics. You know, so our fraud toolkit finds more bad guys by considering how they're related to each other, not just each individual thing they're doing. Uh, and, and you know, certainly the more these tools get used with their magic prognostications, the more experts, typically skeptical, smart people, want to know what the heck the you know recommendation was about. So you know, those are some of the big trends uh, we're seeing. Uh, Edward, tell us a little bit about um, what you're seeing in uh, in ML. Uh, you you alluded to it a little bit before. Well, yeah. So I was I was talking about some of that back office, uh, you know, kind of post trade just process, right? So a, a big thing you have to do is you make a trade and you've got to match then the wire that ultimately comes in to pay for that mm -hmm. trade. And even though you have a lot of tools uh, that help you match the wires with the trades and fund allocations, things like that. They're, you know, they're, they're specialized and um, they're, they're insufficient. I mean, it's just something we heard from, from clients a lot over time. So being able to have a, a much more flexible user enabled experience, that's what I think, you know, ML is gonna really help those kind of back office people. In the front office, uh, a lot of these 
illiquid assets or alternative assets, um, you know, they, they come with strings attached. They're in certain types of funds, which have uh, certain rules about, you know, how much you can allocate to certain asset classes. You have a lot of compliance around these. And so you're, you're, you want to have, um, a lot of our clients are saying they want to have optimization systems, right? Where they can say, you know, give me some suggestions. You know, I'm a trader. I have the secret sauces in terms of what I think I should be trading in, but, you know, I, I want to maximize this certain uh, return, but still remain in compliance um, against, you know, 20, 30, even 100 different tests. And that's a perfect application for, uh, you know, artificial intelligence to do that. You can, these are things, these are uh, kind of models and decision making tools. We go way back to what we, where we started. We're in spreadsheets, right? Trader built his own mm -hmm. spreadsheet that helps him kind of figure out what he wants to trade, he, she wants to trade. Artificial intelligence is going to be able to to take advantage of a much larger data set and also uncover um, relationships that were not necessarily programmed into that model initially. So you got a lot more flexibility and scalability going forward. You know, that the, the examples you gave there, you know, we've seen across multiple places. One of my favorite civilian examples is chess, right? I think there's these well-documented conversations where some of the best chess experts can be beaten by pretty good chess players using a chess computer to help them, right? That you may not be able to think as fast as Magnus, but you probably have some chess intuition. And with the help of a computer, you can actually beat him. We see that described this way in our supply chain work, right? Like planning the next four years of a, a crop sciences supply chain can't yeah. just be done by magic. But if I have tools, I can make more people as good as Fred, the supply chain planner, but, rather than replacing Fred. Yeah. How can I make people more like him? You know, it's like putting on an exosuit, right? A, a skeleton that makes you better, stronger, faster. Yeah. And, you're, and you're getting that, that ultimate end user is much closer to that, that entire development process because you've given them a better tool set than they've ever had before. So it's a much right. more immediate application of their subject matter expertise into some tools that are then going to help them do their job going forward rather than filtering through, um, you know, business analysts, coders, developers, project managers, and then six months Sultans, later, you've got kind of something that kind of resembles what you thought in your head uh, you wanted to have. Yeah, no, very, very true. Uh, Tim, how about from your side? Yeah, so uh, I guess two or three, two or three points come to mind. Um, you know, I think um, the first thing is, you know, we'll see an increased democratization of access to the tools, right? So we've talked a bit about Python, um, and some of the libraries available there and the training that's going on. But there's also uh, AI machine learning platforms, which are really now quite mature. This is a screenshot from one company I followed for a few years called H2O. Data Robot is another one. There's a few other firms. Um, and they are um, using uh, the most advanced technology to allow individuals to build very advanced um, algorithms to predict pretty much anything. You throw data at these systems, and it will run through hundreds of different models, find the best one and present you with the answer. Now, I'm sure Lynn will say there's lots of you know, risk around that in terms of whether that, you know, you're overfitting the data and all that kind of stuff. But, but these tools are becoming really accessible. I was out in Seattle at Microsoft maybe a couple of years ago, and they were talking about how they're gonna get AI and machine learning into Excel, right? So I'm obviously a big Excel fan. You've got Power Query, you know, I suspect what's coming next yeah. is going to be simple ML tools so that if you're running a small business or a big business, you can show it some data and it will help you predict next month's sales or help you predict where the next sale is coming from um, or where the market's going, frankly. The, 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 the screenshot on the right-hand side is a real case. I mean, it shows you how access to data and the tools is, is really empowering people to kind of uh, get access to these capabilities that used to be locked up in the, you know, just in the biggest hedge funds. So we sponsored a, um, a free code camp um, course, free code camps, a, a nonprofit, they have 13 million subscribers. And uh, we thought it'd be fun to kind of sponsor a, um, a training course. They put them up on YouTube. Um, they launched this at the beginning of um, December and by, by the end of December, they'd had 200,000 downloads or views of the video. And these are people get kind of going through the four hour course. Um, and that's basically using open source code. Um, you know, you're running this stuff on, you know, in the cloud for free. And, um, and this is, this particular course uses our free 
our free data. So you can build a predictive algorithm with our data, uh, you know, and in four hours, you're, you're kind of coding like a pro. So it's pretty exciting. Um, the third one I will mention, and uh, I'll give you one data point. Um, obviously, we've seen this massive explosion in, in retail investing, uh, certainly in North America, and I think globally. Um, and some really interesting things going on in the market, if you were watching GameStop yesterday. Um, but it's, it, you know, and Robin Hood is obviously one of the big, the big movers. Um, they, they did an acqui hire of a company called Quandl, and Quandl are a bunch of quants, right? And I think the, the, cult, the kind of whole um, robo-advisory space is going to start to kind of evolve rapidly. So we've got fairly simple tools out there, but now that you've got the ability through other platform providers like Plaid to aggregate your portfolio, uh, then a lot of the tools that Edward was talking about, which are being built into asset managers, are actually very quickly going to be available to individuals. So the, the, the whole kind of access to advanced analytics, machine learning, portfolio optimization, all those things that used to be only done on mainframes with lots of quants, it's kind of going to be available to you and me, which I think is hugely empowering. And as long as people can get access to the data, which is obviously one of the things that we're very keen to do, yeah. um, then the sky's the limit. You, you can invest like, a, you know, to an extent, like an expert. Now, obviously, you need years of experience and a CFA and you need to understand how to value a company, all of those things. You have to learn those over time. But a lot of the tools and mechanics, I think, are becoming much more accessible. You know, this is actually something that we saw in the oil and gas industry. Uh, one of our contacts there is uh, pretty high up in the uh, exploration group at one of the, the super majors. And uh, he, he told me last year, we were in London actually, saying, uh, you know, I'm tired of forming consortiums with all my other oil companies to get software built over five year periods to do what my geophysicists need done, for example. I'm instead seeing a whole generation of people coming out of school, as you said, out of your graduate programs, knowing Python and willing to jam together some stuff. So if they have a new, you know, seismic to well tie synchronization workflow that can unlock value, I don't need to wait two years for Schlumberger to build it based on a bunch of expensive hotel dinners. They can build it in two months if I have the discipline and the effort to make my data accessible to them and make the tools accessible to them and make them secure and support them in that. Uh, and that's just a whole better way of thinking, in my opinion. It's a much more agile way. Back to the Learn programming kid from uh, early, from earlier today. Um, yeah, so uh, Lynn, tell us a little bit about what, you, what what we've seen in ML. Yeah, and uh, some of the trends we've seen. I'm going to kind of counterbalance a lot of this discussion of uh, while it's true a lot of machine learning NLP um, helps to bypass humans in a way or automate you know what taking them out of the loop. There's also a lot of trends in finance as, as well as just kind of generally um, that are new and emerging roles for humans in the loop, on the loop, and, and, and an intrinsic part to um, having successful and trustworthy um, machine learning AI. And, uh, you know, being able to, uh, starting with the user themselves, you know, one of the big trends we've seen, as there's been more uptake, um, and as we talked about, the data is more complex and People are, are trying to do more complex things with it, but uh, you have these these domain experts typically that you know, heck, they could they could hold a million SKUs kind of in their head and notionally say that recommendation doesn't make sense to me. I think it should be one of these five, and they'll probably be right. And they have Excel they've used for twenty years, and they can model <laughs> all of this and get pretty darn close, right? So why are they going to trust? Uh, you know, a recommendation, um, or for example, or a prediction or some analytic. Um, so this notion of explainable AI, you could see a little screen capture there on the bottom right, where it's very, in this case, it's kind of a very simple explainability pattern where there's a recommendation coming out of the system to say, system says you should reject this, you know, reject this transaction or whatever it is, right? But below there, it's saying, here are the reasons why. Here are the things that percolated up um, that trended in the models, and this is why it was made. And right there, giving, um, you know, offering up rationale uh, 
instills trust, um, but it also, you know, gives uh, gives the human an opportunity to become part of that loop, <laughs> where now they have context and a basis in which they can start to try to make a decision. And the cool thing that happens um, at the bottom here, where I mentioned humans in and on the loop, the really cool thing that starts to happen there is is the is a reinforcement learning, where you get into a cycle of algorithms learning from humans and humans also learning from algorithms that have the ability to crunch through a lot more data than they will have ever had the opportunity to crunch through and just to be presented with information that they may have never considered. In this case, like, oh, you mean that having a certain number of connections to other pieces of data really should influence whether I decide to reject or accept something, you know? Um, and so it, it's, it's this very interesting kind of cycle um, that's hugely valuable that, that's really started to emerge between explainable boy and humans in the loop. And, and another role um, for humans is being able to kind of audit um, the AI. We, we've seen this trend and there were just a couple of minutes ago, we were talking about questions of like, should everybody code and how do you judge quality and you know, all these things. Um, and so it, it's a super important thing to be able to understand your training models on tons of data. What is the source of the data? What's the provenance of the data? What's the lineage? You're also sometimes outcomes from one run of a machine learning model become inputs to another run, right? Mm -hmm. So if you if your outcome is biased, you're perpetuating the problem forward, right? So, you know, what does it mean to, to have um, accurate, unbiased, you know, results? And, and this is this is still very much in flux across a variety of industries, right? There is this notion um, really um, popping out that there should be audible frameworks, right? There should be um, sort of uh, standards to which, um, you know, companies are held accountable of um, how they're using the data, how they're checking for bias and ethics. Eh, eh ethics um, and validating that on an ongoing basis. On the top right there is an example of a screenshot of a tool that we use that uh, isn't meant just for data scientists so that someone um, who's a non-data scientist could come in and they could spot trends to see if a model that's in the process of training is headed in the right direction given what they know. So subject matter experts, right? These are tools where they can help and be, be involved in that audibility um, process and be, be a human in the loop in the training process as well. So lots of trends here um, where humans being kind of taken out of the loop, but also whole new roles for humans um, being uh, percolated up of, of becoming part of these AI solutions, um, which is very exciting. Yeah, that auditability is pretty important in a regulated industry like this one, isn't it? Right. It's, it's actually illegal. Yep. It's actually illegal to train it your is. model to do some things. Right. So um, yep. a re really yep. important point. So I think there's one more topic we wanted to talk about, and I'll ask the speakers to be extra pithy and short since we're short on time. Um, and, and that's uh, ESG. Um, I wanted to bring it up uh, just from a macro perspective, even if it doesn't seem like it's very related to technology, it's driving so much capital flow along with, you know, the kids on Robinhood buying out of the money options today. Um, you know, at Xperia, we looked at a, uh, a client looking to understand their portfolio from a perspective of ESG. Uh, we have another a client in the commercial IoT space. Uh, these are guys that help skyscrapers reduce their carbon footprint. Their sales have skyrocketed. Um, just because companies are looking to account for their carbon footprint, even before they are actually, you know, known to be actively fixing it, right? So just this imprint of ESG is driving sales cycles, is driving product development, is driving uh, capital allocation. How's it affecting us uh, in, in finance tech? Uh, Edward, briefly, may I remind you, what are your thoughts? Well, basically, ESG is going to become a whole new set of metrics that are going to evolve over the next few years uh, to, to go alongside with your traditional financial measurements, you know, you've got your IRRs, your return on capitals, your prices, you know, those are all very standardized metrics with um, you know, very robust sources uh, for that information. With ESG, those standards are still evolving. There aren't really standardized metrics. Um, so you have to kind of coalesce on those standards first, and then all of that stuff can feed into um, everything that we've talked about earlier today. So the, the first thing is, you know, how do you collect this data? A lot of it exists in systems that are not typically part of your, uh, you know, your financial ecosystem, right? Information in, on hiring diversity is gonna be in your HR system. Um, you know, building management is gonna contain some of the information you just, you just mentioned. Well, that, that, that's nowhere near any kind of portfolio management system you know, right now. Yeah. Um, so we've got to figure out ways of, of getting to that information, bringing it out, standardizing it, and then 
layering that into all of the other metrics uh, that we look at, because only then can you really make uh, you know, meaningful decisions between companies, between investment opportunities and compare them. Right now, they're really just footnotes in, in financial filings or press releases. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, gonna use, it take a lot of work to get there. Uh, Lynn, your thoughts? Yeah, you know, um, really, as Edward mentioned, the holy grail in this is uh, being able to define those metrics to measure. But I would say, uh, you know, especially in the context of everything we've talked about today with these massive data sets coming from lots of different places that are needed um, to do um, ESG monitoring, you know, rather than having it be top down where the SEC is just going to kind of bestow or whatever governing body is going to kind of bestow uh, upon us all what these metrics would be, perhaps we could try a different approach of utilizing some of this technology um, and then some of the things we've been talking about today with all the data, different data sources, the connected data, the AI, and, and, and maybe we could let uh, some of those metrics emerge from the data itself, being able to spot trends and, and things that would be actual meaningful metrics rather than necessarily coming top down from a governing body, maybe both directions. <laughs> Certainly, Tim, it would, thoughts, it would thoughts behoove the you. industry to get out ahead of that instead of waiting for uh, the regulators yeah. to impose it. Yeah, I just had a couple of couple of thoughts on this, um, and I totally agree with you, Edward. You know, data standards are really all over the place. And when I was at Thomson Reuters, now Refinitiv, we acquired a company called Asset Four, and they were very early movers, and um, actually way ahead of the curve. This was like 12, 15 years ago. Since then, all of the big vendors now have an ESG offering, mm -hmm. but they all give you different signals. Um, mm -hmm. We have a company on our platform, Extract Alpha. They do a great job of ranking companies and applying factors. Um, but again, you know, until the um, the filing agencies require those standards, it's, it, it, it is going to be very difficult for investors to, to cut across that data. Um, and I think until we have that, all the companies are going to game the system a bit, right? <laughs> They have an interest in showing up well um, mm -hmm. and while that data is somewhat opaque um, you know the, the the inclination will be to kind of make the data play to their advantages um, and then looking at companies across industries you know I think you know you guys Sebastian you work in the oil and gas industry you know they they have a bad reputation but actually you know they are sometimes amongst the most green firms I mean my my wife's old company BP were the biggest solar uh, company at one point so uh, you know I think it's very difficult to kind of make statistically apply numbers um, to something as complex as ESG yeah. yeah especially when you add all the money to it right um, so fantastic Th thank you guys for that conversation we did have one question come in which I thought I'd just ask you to answer Tim which was uh, from an earlier topic self-programming is also scary so learn to program yeah. kids right well who's doing the testing to make sure the outcomes are accurate well, I remember, I think this was like 20 odd years ago, one of the big um, consulting firms and it, it was someone like Accenture did a study of Excel spreadsheets. And I think in 95% of the spreadsheets, they found material errors. Yeah. Um, and I can't imagine that that's gone away. Um, and obviously the software industry and you know the way that we release code, for example, you know, any professional software company has a whole process to check the you know the code and even then sometimes errors are made so look i think it's going to be a i think it's going to be a challenge you know it's one thing empowering individuals to write their own code i think there are some technologies that are now uh, talk about you know software eating itself um you know there are there's machine learning that that's being applied that's enabling people to write better code and you know, again, if you use the Power Query and Excel example, um, you know, the system steps you through and you can tell as you go through it whether the results make sense or not. And the code's yeah. being written in the background. So you're not writing the code, you're kind of the code's writing itself. And I think you'll start to see more of that in the end user applications. And that will hopefully make that result much more robust. And these no code platforms, you know, are designed with a lot of kind of quality controls built into them. Well, and you know, from our perspective, we've, we've been doing a project recently in actually it's in the cybersecurity space where 
analysts with these Python notebooks are able to go produce models. And now the idea is, uh, you know, if I built this model, can I deploy it to my department so that they can all use it? And, you know, the truth is if you've done a thing and you've taken an action on your thing, that's you, we can't see inside your brain anyway. So you're gonna do what you do. But the moment it steps outside of your desk to your department, you know, there is some sort of quality control process that needs to exist, whether it's your Excel model that you mailed to your buddy or this new Python notebook that we made easy or whatever it is. Like from our perspective, ironically, as a technology consulting firm, this isn't really a technology problem. It's it's, it's a governance problem. Yeah. yeah. Yep. yep. I would agree. Yeah, look, I think peer review is very powerful. And it's obviously, you know, and open the open source community, you know, is also a mechanism for improving the quality of code. Um, yeah. That's a really good point. Sharing it, more eyes on yeah, it. Right? Sharing it, more yeah. eyes. I think that will cover some of the problem areas. Cool. To, Tim, well, to go back to what you said about the, the testing tools that are really that are coming out in conjunction with these technologies are very important. That's true. That's true. Well, with with zero seconds left on the clock, I want to thank you guys for your interesting observations today. Thanks for coming by. And if anyone who attended wants to know more, hopefully you know where to find us, and we'd love to hear from you guys. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, See you guys next time. Bye-bye.